Some of you are probably wondering where the Royals shirt is. I see one back there. That's right. Last night was tough, wasn't it? Whew, that was tough. Uh, but it's not over. So uh, they're, they're, they're in it. We'll see what happens tomorrow, right? We probably should hold prayer All right now. I'm just joking. <laughs> hey, Lunch with Leaders next Sunday. Uh, I would encourage you, if you're somewhat new around the church, maybe you've been here six months, or maybe you've been here a year and still kind of in hiding, this is a wonderful thing to show up to. You'll get to meet um, people like myself and our pastors and, and kind of hear a little bit more about who the church is and eat some good food. So that is next Sunday at lunchtime, uh, right after this service. F feel free to fill out one of those Connect cards. Let us know you're coming, but we would love to have you. We're looking at John chapter 18, verses 28 through 40. That's John chapter 18, verses 28 through 40. If you have a Bible, feel free to read it uh, right along with me. If not, you're gonna be able to see it right up here on the screens. Jesus' trial before Caiaphas ended in the early hours of the morning. Then he was taken to the headquarters of the Roman governor. His accusers didn't go inside because it would defile them and they wouldn't be allowed to celebrate the Passover. So Pilate, the governor, went out to them and asked, what is your charge against this man? We wouldn't have handed him over to you if he weren't a criminal, they retorted. Then take him away and judge him by your own law, Pilate told them. Only the Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders replied. This fulfilled Jesus' prediction about the way he would die. Then Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked him. And Jesus replied, is this your own question? Or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate retorted. Your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said, so you are a king? And Jesus responded, you say I'm a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. What is truth? Pilate asked. Then he went out again to the people and told them, he's not guilty of any crime, but you have a custom of asking me to release one prisoner each year at Passover. Would you like me to release this king of the Jews? But they shouted back, no, not this man. We want Barabbas. Barabbas was a revolutionary. Father, I thank you for your word. I'm thankful that as we open it and as we read it, that you show us things about you, about us, you teach us. And I pray that even as I do my best to share your word today, would you speak to us individually? Would you speak to us and reveal yourself in powerful ways and give us the opportunity to take next steps with you? to be obedient to what we hear, that you would shape us, inform us, to help us look more like you. I ask for your help today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When I think about this passage of scripture, and I was actually thinking about a good prayer for us today. Even as I preach, the prayer would sound something like this. Jesus, teach us how to live as you do. Let me just say that again. Jesus, teach us how to live as you do. That's a big prayer. It's an honest prayer. It's a prayer that says, I'm open to growth. I'm open to change. I want to look more like you. And so then I was reflecting on several things throughout this passage. Things that I would say we might struggle with. Things that might be the opposite. When I think about maybe with the way the world invites us to live in comparison to the way Jesus invites us to live. First thought is this. I don't want to live fighting for power. 
I don't want to live fighting for power. In verse 33, then Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. And he asked them this question. He says, are you the king of the Jews? And then you see in verse 37, Pilate says it again. He goes right back to it. So you are a king. It's interesting, isn't it? That he keeps asking him, are you a king? So you're a king. See, Pilate knows there isn't room for two powers. There's only room for one. Pilate knows that the idea of Jesus as king would compete with the authority of the Romans, would compete with his own authority. And I love Jesus' response to the question, because here's what he says. My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. In a sense, he's saying, you're thinking of this all wrong. My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. See, Jesus clarified his kingdom would be defined and lived out differently from how they understood kings and kingdoms. That Jesus' way was, was different. And isn't it interesting? I mean, this is still true today. We're talking 2,000 years ago. This is all unfolding and yet today, it's still true. I look around and there are times when I see the world and all the things happening around us. And if you listen to the voices, whew, you can't help it, can you? you? You begin to feel fearful and anxious if you're not careful. You begin to respond from a place of trying to retain power. It raises concerns in us. Like, how do I live in a world where my beliefs and my ways are not the center? Fear wants to tell us that we're losing. Fear wants to say, I'm not comfortable in this world. And yet Jesus' kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. And Jesus is really saying, you're not going to be comfortable here. My kingdom is different than the kingdom that you find yourself living in. And can I just say this? If, if he wanted us to lead with power in the public circle, he probably would have displayed that intention when he was in the public circle. See, instead, he chooses to live out this unique kingdom perspective that reveals his real power fueled by love, by courageous strength, and, and consistent belief in the way of the Father. I mean, when you look at this, it's so other. And you know what else I love? How many times after this, on the way to death, that Jesus is spoken of as the King of the Jews? See, we know it was in a mocking way, but God is finding ways to declare his truth about his son all the way to his death, even in the mocking, even in those who are, are trying to kill him. Don't miss this. There's hope that even when Jesus seems to be anything but crowned king, that the Father is making it known who the real king is. That's hopeful. Jesus, teach us how to live as you do. And then the second thought is this. I don't want to live emotionally unregulated. You may say, what? Let's just talk about emotional dysregulation. They may feel overwhelmed, have difficulties controlling impulsive behaviors, or have angry outbursts. These intense responses can cause trouble with relationships, work, school, and daily life. Do you know anybody who, who wrestles with emotional dysregulation? Maybe it's you. Maybe it's hard to control your impulsive behaviors. Your angry outbursts get the best of you. They're intense responses that cause trouble in your relationships. I was over one morning at Walmart really early. I was actually looking for some medicine, and so I love going to Walmart early in the morning because no one is there. So I pulled into the parking lot, and I parked, and I got out of the, I got out of the truck, and I started to walk in, and I, I was walking towards the door, and all of a sudden, I heard what sounded like screeching tires. 
Not like someone was peeling out fast, but like someone had come to a very quick halt. Like someone had stopped hard and slammed on their, on their brakes and it made this sound behind me. And so, you know, curious, as I'm walking, I turn around and I see a guy jump out of his car. As another car is pulling off, he begins to yell at him in very colorful language. And it wasn't like this two sentences. It was like he was unloading. And I, I wanted to say, hey, guy, like, I don't think he hears you, right? It was interesting, as I looked at the vehicle, I looked at the back and there was this little cross symbol that looked like a weave. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but when this whole thing went down, I was trying not to stare. But at the same time, I, in fact, I went in the store and there's not a whole lot of people in there, so I thought, I wanna see when this guy comes in. I'm just curious what he looks like. I, I, I'd be kind of curious to see if he looks stressed because my guess is the response that happened in the parking lot had nothing to do with the other car that he encountered. My guess is what happened in the parking lot had to do with eight other things going on in his life. Whether it's stress with a spouse, whether it was stress over finances, whether it was something going on at work or the lack of work. I have no idea, but I can tell you this guy had some issues going on that day. It, it, for a while, it kind of, um, it stuck with me because I even, I was thinking about my own life, how many times, right? Like, do I respond not about the thing? It's the thing that sets me off about the eight other things that I have going on in my life. Here's what Jesus says in verse 36. My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight. You see this? My followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. He's saying, we do it differently. Just a few verses before this, I want you to see the comparison with how Peter responds and how Jesus responds. This is really interesting. When the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, do you remember what Peter did? We might call it emotional dysregulation. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? I mean, Peter is ready to fight. Peter is saying, hey, Jesus, we can win this thing. Just let me pull out the sword and chop more ears. I mean, can you picture that? I actually was like, I thought it was pretty impressive that a guy could pull a sword and just carve out an ear. But what you have is Peter is responding in the moment. It's an emotional response. It is like he sees it and he pulls the sword and hacks off the ear. And then you get this other picture where Jesus is calculated. And he's doing his best to carry out the will of the Father. Not emotionally responding, but thoughtfully responding. See, what if our first response is less emotional and about us and more intentional and about the Father? Can you imagine what that might do for our relationships? You know, my responses are always better. I was sitting there thinking, you know, the, the truth is when we have a relationship with Jesus, I believe this 100%. When you have a relationship with Jesus, your relationships will be better with others. He helps you. And I started thinking about my own life. Like, when is it that I tend to lead towards emotional responses? See, my responses are always better when I spend time with Jesus, period. If I have a regular time with Jesus, my responses typically are better. We call it the fruit of the Spirit. That as we spend time with Jesus, Jesus, his spirit produces things in us that we cannot produce on our own. That it's actually less of us and it's more of him. I would also say this, my responses are always better when I'm rested. You ever, you ever notice that? Like when you get tired, when you go and you go and you go and you go, like your responses tend to change because you have no margin. You're worn out. 
At least it does for me. It's why, it's why the Bible talks about the Sabbath. Because we were meant to rest once in a while and refill the tank. Or my responses are always better when I'm less anxious. So I was thinking about this, right? Even maybe some of these fit you. But for me, prioritize time with Jesus. Once in a while, take a break. Re-energize. Sabbath. Or practice praying and trusting the Lord to help calm your anxious thoughts. I mean, even, even this week, before I got to this passage, actually, Monday, I was in the kitchen, and I'd almost forgotten, but I had made a commitment to myself that I was going to do something on October 1st. And, and um, so I decided I was just going to log out of Facebook. And, and so sure enough, I mean, I logged out and I took the thing off my, the app off my phone. And, because, you know, it, it's interesting, isn't it? For me, when I, when I go to Facebook and I begin to look, I don't know, it works me up. I mean, sometimes somebody says something and I watch 18 other people respond and it looks like one big claw cat fight thing going on, Right? I mean, it's so calming, right? Just ushers peace in my life continually. I mean, why do we do it, right? I mean, part of me says, take a look at your life. What is it that makes you more anxious? What is it that works you up? Because when you're worked up, you don't respond the same. So for me, I tell you, I logged out and I was like, it was weird, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I'm like, whew, it's amazing. When I actually just sit with you, or if I'm with you face to face, if I'm with the people in front of me, there's very little drama. I mean, maybe there is, you're talking about me back here and I don't know it, but hey, I'm good with that. There's very little drama. But if I'm online and I'm on in all this, blah, there's just drama in my living room. So just, just cut it out if you need to. Or think about this, I don't know, maybe some of you. How many of you would say the news works you up? Come on, be honest. Eight of you, good. There's 80 of you. There's 100 of you. The news works you up. So what do we do? We leave it on all day. Leave it on eight hours a day. Just chirp it in your living room. Does it bring you peace? No. It doesn't. It works us up. So think about this, because this is really important. Can I tell you, when you're worked up and you respond emotionally and you say things you don't want to say, do you know who you say the most of those things to? The people you love most. You don't go to the, I mean, I, mean, I guess the guy at Walmart did. Typically, you don't go out and just let it hang out, right? You, you respond to those that you're closest to. Do you know who gets it for me? Who gets the worst side of Kevin? John Pickens. You thought I was going to say my wife. I try to work it out at church before I get home, right? <laughs> Rachel's like, oh, no, I get it too. <laughs> oh, yeah. But just like a week ago, I mean, you know, I snapped on John, and he was gracious. In fact, I think he was saying, go ahead, Kevin, get it out, right? He knew I needed it. But the truth is, our relationships, like, we to honor them, right? To really honor our relationships. Let's ask Jesus how to do them well. Where do we need help? What step do you need to take? Jesus, teach us how to live as you do. Or how about this? I don't want to live chasing a moving target of truth. It's tiring. It's overwhelming. This is really important. I want you to hear this. Pilate said, so you're a king? And Jesus responded, you say I'm a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize what I say is true. And then Pilate asked this incredible question. What is truth? It's amazing. Again, this was a big question back then. It's still a big question today. What is truth? I was actually listening to a message not long ago from a guy you may have heard of named Craig Rochelle. It was very interesting. See, we live in a world where we hear the phrase over and over, your truth, my truth. Hey, that, that's my truth. Oh, that, John, that, that's your truth. 
We, we throw that out. My truth, your truth. And I'm not, not to say, we all have a story. We all have a story to tell. We all have a perspective to share. And it's valuable. But there's only one truth. Let's be careful how we throw the word truth around. Jesus actually said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But Kevin, my truth is based off my own experience. My truth is, is based off, Kevin, of, of what I've experienced. And, and it feels right. It matches like my life. It sounds right. It has to be true. And I would just say the Bible cautions us in that kind of thinking. In fact, here's what the Bible might say. Proverbs 14, there's a path before each person that seems right, but ends in death. Or Jeremiah 17, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? You can't always trust what you feel and you can't always trust your emotions to tell you the truth. Oftentimes they will lead you astray. See, people look for truth to align with their ideas rather than having their ideas shaped by the truth, understood in a relationship with Christ in a relationship with the church. Even I want you to hear this, there's so many times, right, where we slip away and we're by ourselves to hear the truth from God. And I, I actually think that's good. For some, though, they're like, oh, yeah, I just got to get away. I need to go for a walk in the woods. Like, that's where I hear from him. But can I tell you, there are times even, here, here's what the church can be for each other. That when I go for a walk in the woods and I hear like what seems like the truth, Jesus talks to me on that walk in the woods. Then I come back and I sit with three of my brothers and sisters and say, let me tell you what I heard in the woods. Does that sound like what Jesus would say to me? Like that's the power of the church. That, that we hear the truth together. That, that, that we hear the truth and we help filter it with each other. Is that consistent with his word? Is that consistent with who he is? It's part of even why students, we want you to be in small groups with great leaders who lead you so that you can say, hey, this is what I'm hearing. Will you help me to filter it? I heard a story the other day and someone was saying, they were talking about college church. They were talking about how their friend moved away and they just said, you know, one of the things he says that he deeply appreciated when he was here is that every time he showed up, he just always heard about Jesus. That's intentional. I will always err on the side of talking about Jesus over and over and over because he is the truth. And as we hear about Jesus, what happens is we hear the truth and then we shape the way we think and we shape our ideas based upon what Jesus says is the truth. And I'm telling you, if you will do that, your life oh, will be so much better. Because the way that Jesus has designed, the truths in which he's given, like when we live these ways, he has our best interest in mind. Jesus, teach us how to live as you do. And then finally, I don't want to live always needing to have the last word. What if we don't have to have the last word? What if we don't have to be right? It's hard, isn't it? If you follow this story through John 19, I mean, here's what you'll see, that Jesus made his way to the cross. They hung him on a cross. They posted a sign over his head that said, he said, I'm the king of the Jews. He was mocked. He was tortured. And yet, he didn't need to have the last word. How hard is it not to defend yourself, to not desire to have the last word? In fact, many of you know that feeling. It happens a lot. I, I remember when... I was on a, this was years and years ago. I was on an, uh, a little vacation. We were out in Arizona. And we got on the wrong interstate and 
we were out in the middle of the desert, right, like driving the wrong direction. There were four of us in the car, it was two couples, me and my wife and another uh, couple, and we're cruising along. And yes, I had gone the wrong direction, I was driving. And that can be a common theme in our house. Um, but as I was going, it became very apparent there was not an exit, not for a long ways. And so I'm driving and I'm driving and I'm driving. And my wife is in the back and she's encouraging me strongly. She's saying, hey, there's all these little pull-ins. Just, just, just pull in and turn it around. And, and internally, you know, I was raised like, I abide all the rules, right? Like I follow them. And so as she's saying that, I'm like, no, we're not gonna do that. There'll be an exit. And she, she keeps at it. No, we're not gonna do it. There'll be an exit. But no, no. And then finally I was like, fine. And you know, I'm sweating inside and I'm, you know, I'm nervous. There's no one around. So sure enough, I pull in there and the moment I pull out, I start going and I look and I see behind me. <laughs> Needless to say, I pulled over and got to visit with one of Arizona's finest. And it was so hard when he left the car. I mean, I knew it was that moment, right? Do I just keep my mouth shut? Or do I get the last word? <laughs> you can probably guess what happened. Yeah, of course it did. I told you so, right? But can I tell you something? I told you so, or I get the last word, or I am right, you were wrong. How does it help your relationships? It's usually not good. More often than not, we're just better to go, I don't have to have the last word. As I think about these these ideas that are found in this passage of scripture, Jesus teaches how to live as you do. What if we didn't have to be in power? What if our first response looked more like a response that comes from Jesus than us? What if we would live with less proclamation of our truth and more in alignment with Jesus, the truth? What if we didn't always need to have the last word? What if we recognize that our king looks different from how others would define a king? I'm guessing there's times when fear raises its head in your life that sounds like you're losing power. Take it back by force. Do not let them have the last word. We serve a king who resisted power, who resisted having the last word, and had no fear of looking like he lost in the moment. He redefined a different kind of kingdom that would result in a new way of living. And he continues to invite his followers 2,000 years later to do the same. The world always lures you to live in this kingdom. While Jesus continually reminds us, we live in this world, but we're not of it. Father, I thank you for your word. Even this week as I was typing, I'm thankful that you show me things before I ever stand in this spot. God, I pray for our people. Help us to live more like you. Oh, would you help us? God, I do believe when we live according to a different kingdom, it speaks loudly in the world that we live. Help us not to fall into the trap of looking more like this world, looking more like we're from this kingdom versus yours. I do believe you've placed us here. I do believe you've called us to live to live here in this world. But God, I pray that our, that our words and our actions, that our thoughts, 
they would look more like you. We, we recognize, we confess, we can't do that on our own. We confess that we need your help and we trust you to do that work in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Pastor John's gonna come in a moment and we're gonna receive communion together. I wanna say if you're a guest here today, just know this, you don't have to be a member of College Church to participate in communion. In fact, we would invite you to participate. Part of your participating is saying yes to Jesus. Like, I, I want to know him. I want to experience him. If you came in today and you did not receive the elements, just raise your hand and our ushers who are walking around right now will make their way to you. So if that's you today, and yep, got some hands back here. And we're gonna sing a song together. I just wanna create room Maybe as I was preaching to you today, you sense the Lord is challenging you to take some sort of step in your life, to trust him. Maybe you would say, I wanna bring my elements and I'm gonna to come to an altar and just, I need, I need some time alone with Jesus. I'd invite you to come. And then when this song concludes, Pastor John will come and he'll lead us in receiving those elements together.